Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't remember the first time I saw the picture, but the image has stuck in my head. That picture found ancient graffiti unearthed in Rome. And it's a piece of ancient graffiti meant to mock Christians. See what you're looking at. There's a man. His arm is stretched up in worship. And of course, there's the figure of a man, the body of a man, but the head of a donkey. And you see where he is. He's on a cross. And then in Greek, scribbled below, etched into the plaster, is this saying. It says, Alexamenos, that's the man doing the worship, Alexamenos worships his God. Like I said, this is a piece of ancient graffiti. It's meant to mock Christians. And the saying was obvious to all who saw it. Christians worship an ass of a God. That's what it was saying. And it makes sense when you put yourself back in those times And you imagine hearing about the Christian God for the first time. God came down to man in the form of a man. Not to rule over men, but to die on a Roman cross. Have you ever heard such a silly thing? That God would die on one of our crosses. You know that the Romans, when they talked about their gods, the gods always ruled over man. The gods did powerful things. And the God of Christians, this Jesus, well, he looked like such a pathetic God. The message was clear in this, this graffiti, this ancient graffiti. You're out of your mind if you are a Christian. You are out of your mind if you follow Jesus. Well, as we've been looking at fake news over the last couple of weeks, and we'll be looking at the next couple of weeks, fake news stories about Jesus, we see this headline today. Jesus is out of his mind, and of course, implied is that if you follow this Jesus, you are too. You're crazy if you're a Christian. This was said back then, and I would argue it is still being said today. This headline, this fake news, still out there. Of course, it's surprising when we find out where the fake news came from, where the headline came from in our gospel from Mark. It came out of Jesus' own family They saw what he was doing and they were concerned. Think of it as an intervention. That's what they wanted to do. And they said to each other, he is out of his mind. And of course, they had with them the Jewish religious leaders. They had come from Jerusalem to see what Jesus was up to. And they also concluded something was wrong with this guy. But their conclusion was that Jesus, well, he must be demon-possessed. I realize that today's Bible reading, the gospel from from Mark chapter 3, it's not the normal Jesus story that you're used to hearing when we come to church. We're used to hearing about Jesus healing the people, giving sight to the blind, helping people out, and all of the crowds are there, and they're all following him, which of course was true. We saw that this morning too, but what we, what we don't always take into account is that, that this Jesus, who was popular, at least for a time, also was a Jesus who had people turning away from him because of the offense they saw in him. He is out of his mind. This guy must be demon-possessed. The headline, the fake news, still present today of course the truth is Jesus came and he is a divisive person not divisive in the sense that he came to start fights with whomever whomever he could but divisive in this way think of a boulder falling into a river and the water now has to go one of two directions it either goes to the right 
or it goes to the left. The one thing the water cannot do is ignore the boulder as if it didn't exist. That's really how Jesus is. Jesus came to this earth like a giant boulder and took his stand with a claim. And the claim was that he is the son of God. And no one can avoid it. Everyone runs up in it, into it. And either they go right or they go left. Of course, Jesus, he backed up his claim. He performed miracles. He did things that only God could do. There was good reason to believe he was who he said he was. But understand this. There are only two options when it comes to Jesus. Either you fall on your knees and you confess him as your Lord, as the Son of God, or, or you've got to come up with some reason that he is not who he says he is. Like, the guy's nuts. The guy is demon-possessed. Or I think you'd hear today, the Bible's just a bunch of fairy tales. Jesus was just a nice teacher or something like that. But no matter who you are, you have to confront the claim of Christ. To the argument that Jesus was demon-possessed, Jesus had a very simple answer. And his answer was from logic. It makes no sense to say that I'm, I'm working with Satan when I'm driving out the demons of Satan. This is illogical. This is unreasonable. Jesus said, how can Satan drive out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself? That kingdom cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. No, the only reasonable explanation for Jesus' power to drive out demons was that Jesus came to destroy those demons. Jesus is the stronger man he's talking about in this parable. He said, if you're going to, to go and, and steal from a strong man, you've got to tie him up first. You've got to disable him, and then you can steal his things. Well, Jesus came as that stronger man to tie up the strong man, Satan, that he would claim for himself again those whom Satan had taken. And of course, this is the entire story of the Bible. Jesus came to undo Satan's work. But his enemies didn't want to hear it. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And so they came up with their lame excuse. The guy is driving out demons in the name of Satan himself. Notice that Jesus was not just content to confront their silly notion. He also wanted to issue a very stern warning. That's why he brings up this warning of an unforgivable sin. You've probably heard of an unforgivable sin and this is where it comes up. This is what he says the unforgivable sin is. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. This unforgivable sin, he says, is blasphemy against God's Spirit. Blasphemy is when you say outrageous things about God. Well, an outrageous thing to say about God's spirit who points you to Jesus, convinces you that Jesus is the one who came to undo the devil's work. To, blasph to speak blasphemy against the spirit is to say, no, Jesus didn't come from God. Jesus is of Satan. And the reason this sin is unforgivable is not because it's too big. It's too big for Jesus. That's not why it's unforgivable. It's unforgivable because committing it rejects the only means to forgiveness. It's like someone drowning and being thrown the life ring and refusing to grab on. For us today, as we see this account of Jesus and as we see what happened to Jesus it's an important reminder that we would not expect anything different. If we're going to follow him, we ought to expect to be treated like he was. We ought to expect the fake news 
Jesus is out of his mind, and so are you. So are you if you follow him. Some authors recently have have said, we're living in what they describe as a post-Christian culture here in the United States. And what they mean is this. Christianity, kind of like a big glacier, moved through, and you still see its effects, but the glacier is melting away. So if you go to the the dells of the Eau Claire and you you walk around there, you can see where the glaciers made the stones smooth, but look around, you're not going to see any glaciers. You see what they left. And that's what some have said about our culture, that Christianity has left its mark, but it is slowly melting away. Which is why I think so many of us are, are confused as we look around and we don't recognize the world we live in. It's right, grandparents who grew up at a time when there just was no question what you did on Sunday morning. It wasn't even a question anyone asked. They, they cannot understand why their adult children don't see the need to go to church. It, it doesn't register. They, they cannot understand why, why those same children may not even want their grandchildren to be baptized. When we think about the world that we live in, we have to take into account the world as it is, not as it was. And we have to recognize that to be a Christian will mean people look at you weird. Will mean that some see this headline, Jesus is out of his mind, and they'll apply that same headline to you. Just think of some of the silly things that Christians believe. That, that all of this, this, this whole world, this whole universe, God created in six days, and what did he use? He used his word. That is incredible. That, that it's not the product of, of billions and billions of years of evolution, and neither are you and I. That God made men and women in his image, and set us apart in this world. How is that gonna fly in your college biology class? People are gonna look at you and say, are you out of your mind? And then of course, it goes on from there. We, we heard about it in Genesis chapter three, that, that this world God created was, was perfect like he is, but sin entered it when a deceiver who took on the shape And the voice of a serpent deceived Adam and Eve to rebel against God and brought into this world that which was foreign, death and sin and all of its consequences. That's what's wrong with this world. But God didn't just leave us to our own destruction. God made a promise. He said the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And this is it for us as Christians. This promise which, which believers have always held on to, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, a promise fulfilled when Jesus came and when he crushed the serpent's head, as we heard in Revelation chapter 20, when he came to slay the dragon. And he did it in the most unlikely way by taking death upon himself, by being put on a cross, a Roman cross, and dying. And this does something for us. It frees us from the devil's power because it frees us from our sin. Yes, we believe that that in Jesus is life, but outside of him is only death. And that we are included in Jesus. We're made a part of him through this thing called faith. And the Holy Spirit gives us this faith. He works this faith in our hearts through the the gospel, this good news that comes to us through the Bible, that that this actually means something and it changes who we are. And that that this this thing called baptism isn't just some water and and some words that that don't really matter. God is doing something. He he did something. He said, you are mine. He made you his own child and he washed you of your sin and he connected you to Christ. And that when when we gather as Christians on the first day of the week, it's not just to learn some stuff about Jesus. You can learn stuff about Jesus at home. It's because Jesus is here with us. 
He actually comes to us through his word where two or three are gathered and he actually invites us to a meal that he himself serves us his own body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Look someone straight in the eye and say that and they will look back at you and say, you are nuts. You're out of your mind. To believe that that, that bread and that wine is Jesus, true body and blood and that it matters that you receive him and with him life and forgiveness Of course, there's a way around this, right? A way around of looking like a weirdo. And that's by saying in private that you believe in this Jesus stuff, but then going into your life and having it never make an impact, never actually change you or what you do, hiding it, so to speak. That's one way to get around it. But Realize that if you own it, if you live it, you ought to anticipate the weird looks that you will get when you tell your friends, yeah, I'm, I'm going to church on Sunday morning. I can't, go, I, I can't go with you golfing or fishing or I can't work this morning. They'll look at you and say, church is so boring. And you can acknowledge it would be boring if Jesus were not here with us. But he is. He is. Anticipate the strange looks when you, when you take money, hard-earned money out of your wallet and you put it in an offering plate and you know that that money could have gone for that new truck, that new boat, a vacation in February to Florida. You know. And then you have your friends tell you, the church is just interested in your money and realize just how crazy you look but you also know that that this is an offering given to God for his goodness to you. It belongs to him anyways, and you get to support this good news, this true story going out into the world to change hearts as it changed your own, to change eternities as yours has been changed. And I wish I could say it's it's just outside voices that might look in at you and say, you're a bit nuts if you follow Jesus. You're out of your mind. But don't our own hearts at times cause us to doubt and to wonder, is this, is this really true? Is this real? Is this worth sacrificing my approval that I would otherwise have from people? My time? my money, and then our eyes go back to him, to the one whom God promised, the one who came, the one who died, the one who rose, the one who is Lord of all, which means he is your Lord too, which means you belong to him, that he has brought you into his kingdom. And that sets you apart, it makes you different than the rest of this world. Just, just think back to that, that man, Alexaminus. We don't know anything about him. This Christian who willingly endured the mockery of his peers. But I think there's something we, we have to learn from him that as Christians, we need to develop an attitude that does not care what the cool kids think. Because what matters in the end is not what anyone else thinks of you, it's what your Lord thinks of you. And what does he think of you? Who believe in his name, who follow his word, who live in his kingdom, he says, these are my brothers and my sisters and my mother. And that is what matters in the end Don't believe the fake news. Jesus is out of his mind and so are you if you follow him. No, believe Jesus. Amen.